Okay, everyone. All right, I'll I'll just get going. So yeah, I can see a few people saying hi to each other in the chat. That's always a good place um, for everyone to to do that. Do do feel free to introduce yourselves. But we're also going to spend a bit of the agenda today putting you into breakout groups so you can meet each other. One of the things that jumped out to me was, you know, we we pitched this as saying, you know, you might have some interest in this topic area of funeral poverty and how we can reduce people's likelihood of falling into funeral debt and things like that. But actually, this clearly the appetite for this meeting shows how much maybe people need to connect across organizations and say, look, we never thought this was something we were going to have to deal with, but we're finding this in our organization and isn't that a surprise? So I thought we should do a little bit of networking within the, the, this session in order to help people make those connections because uh, it's not always, you know, we don't claim to be the only people that are able to do this. You might actually make better connections across each other um, if that's right. OK, let me introduce what we're doing today. So we've got um, 90 minutes. I'm sure some of you uh, might not uh, have the whole 90 minutes. You're probably extremely busy uh, people, but we're going to do 90 minutes today. I'm going to start off. I'm the chair. I'm John Halliday. I'm the chair of Caledonia Funeral Aid, which includes Caledonia Cremation. One second, um, includes Caledonia Cremation. I'm also the co-founder. We founded in 2017, and I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about our history and who we are. And then I'm going to summarize a bit about why we're here, because funeral poverty has come from something where 15 years ago there was, of course, there was a lot to talk about in terms of bereavement being a massive impact on people's lives. But the costs and practicalities of funeral has become a really live issue in the last decade or so. It's becoming more and more pertinent to the people we support and it's becoming a bigger societal issue. So I'll just talk a little bit about that. I'll then hand over for a bit to my colleague Emma Kelso, who you might see her face on this call. Hi. She's going to do talk about her experience advising people in um, around funeral poverty and at the point that they're organising funerals, the difficulty around that. So she's going to, you know, she's got real personal insight, and I think you'll hopefully see some parallels and some things where you can maybe uh, uh, pick her brains around that. We're then going to have that bit of breakout networking session so you can speak to each other and introduce yourselves and make those cross connections uh, and then we're going to hand over to Annie McGovern and Tony Mitchell I can see Tony I, there's too many people on my screen I'm sure Annie maybe is here uh, who are going to uh, from Scottish government perspective help you navigate the Social Security Scotland benefits available around funerals and then we're going to end with what I'm calling a Q&A it's certainly an opportunity for you to ask questions um but I've also a few bits where I'll um, prompt people in the call to say I have questions of my own so we'll, we'll it's a bit of a miscellany at the end hope that suits everyone um if you have questions you can put them in the chat but just be aware that I might have limited capacity to respond to them in real time if that's okay so I'll probably look at that in between sessions and things like that so if you put something in it might take me 20 minutes before I get back to you about it, okay? Uh, or I might follow up in an email. Right, so as I said, um, I chair this. That is to say, you know, I'm passionate about this. I've been involved since 2017 in a setting this up and making uh, Caledonia Funeral Aid become a reality. I'm actually a stage removed from the front line, which is one of the reasons if you're gonna try to improve your ability to help people you engage with navigate this area and the difficulty around it. I'm not always the right person to speak to you, basically. I'm too far removed. I'm a great fan of trying to get the people who know more about it. So that's why I'm just bookending this. We, uh, my colleague, uh, Paul McColgan and I are the two co-founders of this, and this was Paul's idea. I don't want to take credit for something I didn't do, but I then did the sort of startup and setting up of what at the time was just Caledonia cremation. So in in 2015, we recognized the need effectively through Paul's personal experience of having a family member who was actually a 20 uh, something um, it's uh, die in his family. And it just suddenly struck him that this is the sort of area where you don't think about the costs of funerals. You don't think about what's going on. And he was absolutely shocked to discover the sort of costs involved in funerals even then. And by the way, no surprise, it's gone up a lot since then. And the fact that there was little support, a lot of support around bereavement, a lot of compassion, everyone trying to help, but little practical support. So between us, we tried to think about what would be something innovative we could do in this space to try to alleviate funeral poverty. And at the time, we thought the best option might be to try to set up a funeral directors ourselves. And that's exactly what we did, becoming Scotland's first not-for-profit funeral director. Uh, that was called Caledonia Cremation and continues to work just now. But the initial idea we had was let's get in there, disrupt the market, 
and provide a small number of funerals to people and use the profit. And I'll tell you now, funeral directors are often very profitable. Use the profit to invest in community education around funerals, around, around funeral poverty advice for people and a service there. But actually, as we entered the market and we specifically entered the market around direct cremations, not because that's the solution for everyone, it absolutely is not. But we were just thinking, what could we do that's in that, uh, in that space where we could muscle in on some of the um, private uh, businesses and some of the delivery in that space and potentially do it in a very compassionate way? Uh, but actually, it proved very difficult. I'll tell you, on the day we launched with a new price, which was the lowest price in Scotland, um, on that day, the biggest funeral director in Scotland reduced their price by £300 to match our price. So immediately we found that it was very hard to compete with private investment. We started looking at how we could try as a social enterprise to invest in the same ways that private enterprises do, for instance, through marketing, and discovered that it's pretty typical for them to have a million pounds a month marketing budget. And I didn't have a million pounds in the bank, I'll tell you right now. So it was very, very difficult. We've continued to do that, but it proved difficult over those years to become profitable in the way we expected, particularly when what we were really invested in was supporting the 50% of people who couldn't afford, who were coming to us and asking for funerals where they couldn't afford to pay the full amount. So we were cross subsidizing from those who could. So we felt we were doing excellent work. We felt we were disrupting the market, which was exactly what we set out to do, but we couldn't make it. So we had the money to reinvest directly in the funeral advice we wanted to do, at which point COVID hit and we thought, well, we've got to do something now. You know, people were suddenly having to navigate the practicalities of funerals during COVID. There was clearly a gap in terms of the emotional impact of a funeral because there's an emotional impact of bereavement, but there's a separate emotional impact associated with all of this admin you have to do around funerals and the difficulty of navigating that with family members where suddenly you're, you know, a sister you haven't dealt with for a decade suddenly is very invested in the funeral and it creates huge pressure and emotional fallout. So we thought well, we've got to do something and actually we've gone on a journey since then in which basically we've realized we need to create a national service around advice around funeral poverty, funeral practicalities, funeral costs. And rather than just be able to fund it as part of our social enterprise work in funeral delivery, we've made it a standalone entity, which is grant funded at the moment. We have grant funding from a few places, including the Postcode Lottery and uh, National Lottery Communities Fund. Um, we need to be a standalone service to fill this gap that we could see was was there. There's some local work in this space. Funeral Link do an excellent job in Dundee, again, mixing an advice provision with a sort of social enterprising mindset. There's other people out there providing excellent support, but there was a clear national gap, I felt. So we tried to step into that space quicker than we would have if we just had to wait until that funeral director bit was active. We've effectively then become mostly a funeral advice provider that can work on the phone through online resources and provide second tier support for people. So, you know, we, the, our door is always open to say, if you're dealing with someone, we can try to be involved in helping them, even if we don't have direct contact with them ourselves. One of the things we continue to be able to offer is for a small fraction of people who face funeral poverty, we can do something around delivering their funeral in an affordable way, in a compassionate way. But that's become rather than the main bit we do, it's become a smaller part of what we can offer because it's a real subset of people for whom that kind of a delivery is what's needed. We're, one thing I want to point out is we're passionate about trying to end poverty and persistent poverty and inequity across Scotland. It's actually because we're connected to the charity where I'm the chief executive, which is called Community Renewal Trust, although I'll not get into the detail of how that all works out. But our mission is to tackle poverty in all its forms across Scotland. I'm conscious that sometimes when we get into a discussion about funeral poverty, it can sound like we're segmenting poverty. You've got fuel poverty, food poverty, funeral poverty, and it's yet another one. And that is a problem. And I am invested only in trying to end all poverty in Scotland. But one of the bits that we've found is that funeral poverty is one of these areas, perhaps unlike food poverty, for instance, which doesn't lend itself to traditional anti-poverty measures. You know, community led delivery that's holistic and listens to people's needs and tries to connect them to support they need. Funeral poverty doesn't fit that. It's people in the community who suddenly need thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of pounds in their bank account. And without that bit, they're never going to be in a position where they can uh, get out of poverty. You know, it can be a huge burden to them. So it is an area that we feel needs a bit of different approach to how 
um, it's treated. But I would absolutely embrace it if some of you feel a little bit uncomfortable that we segment funeral poverty when really there's just poverty, if you see what I mean. We want to see people be able to face these um, kind of costs and it not be something that sinks their whole house up finances in the, in the round. So I have got my eye on that. I then just want to sort of, before I transition to, to invite Emma in, just draw attention to the scale of this. I'm sure there's people in this call that see this themselves. You may have just one example. You might have personal experience of this. You might be someone who sees this literally every single day. But I think the extent of funeral poverty and funeral debt that people face is something where we don't talk about it enough. In some ways, you've self-selected. You've come to this because you must realize something about it. But the Sun Life um, report that comes out each year, it's a helpful little metric. There's one from Royal London as well. So while these are big monolithic uh, uh, corporate multinationals that we're talking about, actually they provide this really useful service each year and checking in. Their evidence suggests that the average cost of dying, which includes listers costs and things like that, as well as the funeral, is about £9,200 on average. So 50% of people have a higher cost than that. Let's just remember what an average is there. Like 50% of people are over, you know, 10,000 or more, roughly. Within that, 4,000 is the basic cost of a funeral, but that's literally just the, it's not the food at the wake. It's not the service, the celebration of life aspect. It's no, you know, slight, it's no flowers, for instance. It's no kind of ups, um, upsold element. So, Rarely does someone go through a funeral directors without at least some upselling having happened for them. As you will well be aware, most people don't have £4,000 in the bank. Most people don't actually have just a few hundred pounds in the bank. It can sometimes not feel like that uh, because um, we don't see the extent to which people are living on the edge. But particularly as we go through a cost of living crisis, people have eaten up their what savings they might have had. They've rightly directed their savings towards keeping a roof over their head and themselves fed. I'm very conscious that one of the mistakes we can get into around funeral poverty is this sense that people paying off their funeral debt is the most important aspect for people. Having a prepaid funeral plan is the most important aspect for people. I'm not providing financial advice to anyone on this call, but I'm always conscious that people having food on the table, roofs over their head, is the most important aspect. You know, living with the money they've got, the save, using it to 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 make sure that the people who are alive and need that money are prioritized is a difficult tension in this, if you something. So we, we should keep that in mind. It, it can be a bit difficult and controversial about how people manage their debt in this space, how people manage these costs, but you know, making sure people have enough to pay off the funeral is maybe just a way of us actually reinforcing the model in which funeral directors are charging rather a lot and people expect rather elaborate funerals. There's an aspect of pushing back against that and saying we need to lower costs by lowering expectations and the costs in the sector, but also making sure what money is used isn't just used to pay off that debt. People at the moment are borrowing money on an unprecedented scale for funerals. Some people are putting on their credit card, and unfortunately the data around this doesn't divide up who's putting that on a credit card, which is really on the never-never, and they're paying 23% or more to service that debt, and they're never going to pay it off, and it hangs around their neck for years versus people who are putting on their credit card and paying it out their state a bit later. So it's poor evidence in that space, but clearly the rate of people putting it on credit card and not being able to pay is going up. But 15% of people are selling possessions in order to pay for the funeral. Only a minority of that is people selling parts of the estate, by the way, or things they wouldn't have wanted from the estate. It's people having to sell in order to just have enough money. 14% of people are taking on loans from loan sharks. Some of that's bank loans. Unfortunately, it's not well broken down, but it seems like a lot of that is relatively, um, is unsecured debt. And again, hangs around people and has really high interest rates. So, you know, that £9,200 cost of dying is much higher if you apply a 23% interest rate and it takes you 10 years to pay off. This is bringing people down. It's meaning that people are moving increasingly to not having things that they want. Some people are moving towards having lower costs by removing costs that really didn't make a lot of difference to them. A lot of people say, did I really need a limo rather than just a car? There are things that for people can be acceptable cutting of costs, but there's also people cutting costs that aren't acceptable to them. Scaling back a celebration of life, scaling back that, that memorial aspect. Is there really a reason that poor communities shouldn't have as much memorial aspect, you know, headstones, plaques, things in your house that celebrate it, you know, 
an urn for ashes that's that that speaks to you personally just because they can't afford it but they've had to pay off the practical disposal of the body elements of it there's a real inequality in this space and this is double the cost of 10 years ago since covid there's been a change in the market towards more people having direct cremations that was it sort of accelerated an existing um trend and also having simpler funerals overall so there has been a change and the overall numbers have sort of plateaued in the last few years as a result this isn't normal times in that respect we're not back we don't really understand what's going on we don't have the data we don't have it quite the insight so what happens next year is up for grabs in this space but that sense that the costs have been relatively static for the last few years completely hides that it's a decade-long doubling of costs way above inflation in the rest of the market so even if it came down sharply next year, which it's not going to, funeral costs are unbelievably higher than they ever were. Wages are lower than um, they were 10 years ago relative to inflation as well. So people have less, they have less savings, they have less wages and funeral costs have massively ramped up. No wonder there's 57 plus of you on this call. If you're something you must be coming across it all the time. So I, I feel rather a despairing, I have to say, a lot of the time around this. And that's despite some hints of good things happening. We're going to invite Scottish Government to talk later about access to their grant. It's clear that the systems in place and the um, relative flexibility of Scottish Government in this space and generosity of Scottish Government in this space has made a, some impact in it. I don't think they'll mind me saying we all acknowledge that it's only a small part of the overall funeral costs problem less than 10% of people the benefit system is relevant to in this space, uh, which is one, one aspect of that. But also we all recognize that at the moment, no government in this country or others is talking about covering the whole cost of an average funeral. Um, so, you know, we're a long way away from that, but there's been some great progress in that space. But compared to the inflation of the private um, prices of this, that the extent to which we can really take a bite out of funeral costs is um, limited. So I sometimes despair and I'm sometimes op optimistic. One of my greatest optimisms is that we have, um, I noticed we have Jan on the call as well. So Emma and Jan, my colleagues uh, at uh, Caledonia Funeral Aid who do the frontline work we do are, are on the call. And Emma's gonna spend a few minutes talking about her experience at the frontline just now. Uh, uh, what, you know, what, what are the funeral costs that people she's dealing with are facing? What's her experience of, of dealing with people who are in funeral poverty? So Emma, would you mind um, talking to us uh, about that? Um, and you've got uh, roughly twenty minutes. I'll, I'll, if you, if you're overrunning, I'll cruelly step in and and and, and cut you off. But you know, um, do feel free to uh, uh, wing it. Thanks so, so much. Um, I've not met. I think I've met some of you before actually that are on the call, seen some familiar names. Um, so I thought what I'd start with is a little introduction to me. So I've got a little PowerPoint. I'm not ashamed to admit that my I feel my talent is in supporting people and not in PowerPoint. So let's just see how this goes. <laughs> I shall attempt to share my screen and just pull it up for you just now. Here we go. So I've worked for um, Caledonia Aid for just seven months now. And I'll be perfectly honest, every day is still a learning day for me. So keep my fingers crossed, everything goes to plan today. So before I joined Caledonia Funeral Aid and Caledonia Cremation, the majority of my working career was actually in palliative care. I worked with the Children's Hospice for 17 years and then also went to McMillan for a little while as an advanced cancer support worker. Within both these jobs, my sort of remit is supporting families through the end of life journey that they were experiencing. And when you're in there in that holistic journey, I really highlighted and was quite distressing to watch families who were going through this journey and not only were they experiencing the trauma of end of life of a family member, they were also in poverty at end of life. And that thrown in with everything else that they were coping with is just not a good situation at all. And when you're in care, we're taught ways to help socially and emotionally. Medically, we've got all the equipment there. Physically, we can help and get people out and do things. But financially is one area of where when you're in care, you don't really have much tools to be able to help. So I'm watching and listening to people in all these situations throughout most of my working career. It's really driven my passion to try and help as many people 
as possible in Scotland who do find themselves in funeral poverty. Because no matter what or how you're hit with the trauma of a death, and no matter what walk of life you come from, you're all left with the same things that you need to do. You need to organise a funeral. You need to know how to arrange it. You need to know how to cope with it, and you need to know how to pay for it. And these are the areas that at Caledon Funeral Aid um, we're trying to help with. And today we're going to have a wee look at the funeral cost aspect. So there's the short plan. Have a quick glance in case it doesn't quite go to that plan. Um, and as you can see, we're going to start with the figures. And John's mentioned a lot of these figures already, um, but I feel the cost at an average of £9,200 for the cost of dying on average in the UK um, is actually quite a startling figure. You can see that um, the basic funeral average of just under 4000 that John mentioned um, brings Scotland is slightly under that and sits at the 3848 and it's fifth out of all the regions in the UK. You can see it as the fifth most expensive or the fifth cheapest, depending on which way you look at it. But that's where Scotland's sort of average price for a basic funeral is at present. So within Caledonia Funeral Aid, we've been providing advice on the phone and we've recently launched a website. This is a tricky bit. So I thought I'd just take advantage of giving you guys a quick look at it. This is our home page here. Um, we can scroll down and you can see the three main areas that I said that we try to help with at Caledonia, how to arrange, how to pay and how to cope. So if we click here onto the how to pay, hopefully it works. And then in the cost to expect, and you can see there, these are the, what's known as under the funeral director cost, as sort of the send off costs, the extras that make that difference between the cost of an average basic funeral and the cost to die in. So these are the areas um, that can be explored and we can look at to try and help people to reduce funeral costs. So if we were to click into say crematorium costs there, you can see that in Scotland, oh sorry, they vary depending on the region. So they can vary between sort of 600 to 1000 pound, but something that not all people are aware of is that crematorium costs can vary depending on the time slot. So some crematoriums, what they'll do is the very early morning slot, sort of the nine o'clock, half past nine one, which isn't taken up as often, can actually save a family in some cases £200. And that's not something that families are often made aware of or advertised freely. Um, we could look down to coffins and you can see there the range within the price of coffins is huge. You can start around £250-£300, you can go right up to well over £1,000. Now I'm sure the ones that funeral directors recommend, not all do, but some do, are probably about your mid-range. But you can start down at the £300. People could save money in that way. The coffins are all decent standard, all fit for purpose, so you don't always need to go with what the funeral director is recommending. And then of course there's all those other extras that they're seen as cars, flowers, orders of service, newspaper notices. And there's all different ways that families can look into, explore, to get these slightly cheaper and maybe do it in just a different way rather than looking at, is it being cheaper? Cars, you may have a friend who could, who could chauffeur, who's got a nice car. It may be that you could walk as a family because the location is nice and local for you. Flowers, there's all sorts of florists out there and different prices you could go to your local florist shop who you might have a good relationship with to get a better price. Newspaper notices these are maybe seen as old school now because of course with social media um, you can get back to things for free advertise you could put your funeral notice in there and at the bottom was the wake which is probably one of the most expensive costs in many ways for people when they're trying to organise a funeral. But a wake's just an option. It doesn't need to be had or it can be done in so many different ways. And, and some of the people I've spoken to on the phone recently, I've heard some wakes that have been done, done in some nice different ways, such as a family who had a barbecue in their back garden. 
obviously maybe not suitable for Scotland in February and January. Um, but they did that um, just last August um, and they said it was really nice. I had a family who went to a local pub lunch together and that was the local pub of the relative who had passed away and he used to go there every Sunday. So the family actually had a direct cremation and then they went to the local pub on the Sunday just as their dad would have done. I've had a family who had an afternoon tea in the local community centre, all organised with lots of friends and family. So it's just trying to get rid of that culture and belief that a proper funeral has to have a formal week in a hotel. Um, the beauty of all these other ideas is that it's much more personal and can be made more appropriate to the person who has died. So when thinking about sort of the extra cost, I thought it would be good to give you sort of a case study of one of the calls that I had um, just at the end of December, beginning of January there. So we've got Craig, who was 58. It's all anonymised, by the way, different names, different towns. <laughs> who lived in Glasgow, whose lifelong partner, Carol. She worked in an admin job all her life. And Craig gave up his job to care for Carol when she became ill with cancer. So Craig was on universal credit due to not currently working. And when Carol passed away in the hospice, Craig called to his local funeral director. He paid £2,000 deposit up front, which was all the money that Carol had had saved in her savings account. But two weeks after the funeral, there was a balance and Craig was hit with a bill of £2,800 to pay. So how could we help Craig? This situation is not unusual. I could have given you quite a lot of case studies, to be honest, in a similar vein. And on talking to Craig, he gave answers which were quite upsetting to hear, to be honest. Um, the distress of losing Carol. He chatted about how Carol was the organiser of the two of them. Um, even when she was ill mentally, she was talking about the money, or the things that needed to be organised, the bills that needed to be paid. So for Craig, when it came to sorting the funeral on his own, he just felt like it all went by just like in a blur. He was simply agreeing to things he doesn't remember. He says it was, shall we get you a car? Yes. Shall we order you flowers? Yes. Just this kind of flow of conversation where he was agreeing and agreeing and agreeing and not too sure what he was agreeing to or how much it was going to cost. So I think the impact on grief, the impact of grief, sorry, on people when they're trying to arrange a funeral if they've not got a support network or somebody trying to help them, it can be really over, overwhelming. And the feelings that a lot of people have at these times are that this is the last thing that I can do for them. I want to give them the best. If the funeral director's asking me if I want that, I must need it. I'll just say yes. And these are all the type of emotions that Craig described to me. It was only when he received the bill that he panicked. He had no savings and with Carol's savings all having been used for the deposit, he suddenly realised he had no means to pay. Oops, sorry, just get back. So we did a benefit check first for Craig. Um, unfortunately, because Craig and Carol never got married, even though they'd lived together for such a long time um, and they had no children, he wasn't eligible for bereavement support payment. He actually told me have been rejected for funeral support payment. But as we went through it, um, I went through exactly what he had done. It transpired he'd applied for the bereavement support payment and not funeral support payment. So I organised the funeral support payment application, sending them a direct link, and then we did it together um, over the phone because he wasn't very tech savvy, as, just like me, to be honest. Um, but we managed to get that application put in. Even with the application for funeral support payment, even if this is successful, he's still going to have a shortfall of with £1,400. So we then went through a grants check. I used Turn to Us. I looked through potential cancer charities. Um, we looked through previous occupational links just to see if we could find anything at all. And anywhere we tried, unfortunately, Craig didn't meet any of the criteria. So our last option was chatting to the funeral director to see about a payment plan that could at least take that pressure off for finding such a big lump sum, which he just said is just not viable. This situation, I've not got a final good news story to tell you. It's ongoing for Craig. 
He's just waiting for the funeral support payment to come through, although we are hopeful that that will be successful. And he's making the minimal payments to the funeral director at present, but she can afford these minimal payments. Thankfully, in this situation, the funeral director was very understanding of Craig's situation. Craig's case study here, like I say, is unfortunately is not unique, where the funeral date is such a significant figure and these people have no way to pay. What I think it does show is how important it is for us and other people at that, at that point who are helping recently bereaved people to realise that they've got choices to make. We looked previously at specific costs above um, and you can see there's little areas where we can save money. But one that's often overlooked is the funeral director's fees. And we always recommend that you try more than one funeral director for a quote. Because if you take it apart, when you're paying for a funeral, as harsh as it may sound, it's just like paying for anything else. It is a transaction. So why not get another quote? Only 18% of people at the moment in the UK who are organised a funeral get more than one quote. So I think if we could just increase the awareness of how it is OK to actually shop around to get more than one quote, even if it's getting people like us or other people, family members to help to get more quotes, I think that could actually lower the number of people who are left with such significant debt. And funeral directors themselves um, actually reported last year that 90% of their clients and if you think how many people that is, 90% are overspending. They're spending more than they need to. It's, it's a startling number of people who are overspending unnecessarily and one which we really, really need to bring down. So moving on from reducing costs, what about the benefits that are out there to help people? So when you're looking for financial help for people who find themselves in funeral poverty, one of the first and simplest checks that we can do is see if they're entitled to any of the government benefits help that's out there. So in Scotland, the main benefit which can help with funeral costs is obviously the funeral support payment. Um, and I'm not going to go into that because I've got Annie and Tony from Social Security Scotland who are the experts and they know much more about it than me. So I'll just leave that one alone for them. And the other benefit, which is available in Scotland for recently bereaved, is the bereavement support payment. So that's a UK wide benefit and it comes from the DWP, not Social Security Scotland. So that's a benefit that's made up of an initial lump sum followed by up to 18 month monthly instalments. You need to be under state pension age, you need to be married or in a civil partnership, but I will come back to that in a minute. And your spouse or partner must have paid national insurance for at least 25 weeks in one tax year or died due to a work related accident or disease. So there's two levels of the bereavement support. There's a higher rate and that mainly covers people who um, have children or in receipt of child benefit pregnant at the time. And that comes in at a three and a half thousand pound lump sum and then monthly payments of the hundred and fifty pound thereafter. The lower rate basically covers all the other eligible applicants. And this is a lump sum of two and a half thousand and monthly instalments of £100. The application has to be made within 21 months of the death of the spouse or partner. And it, as it can only be backdated for three months, it's really important that the sooner the application is made, the better, as the amount you receive is affected by the date of application. So, it is a wee bit complicated to explain when you're trying to say out all those facts there, but when it's written down, it is much more easier to help somebody through uh, the application and find out if they're eligible. The good things about bereavement support to really know is it's not counted as income for any other purpose. It can be used in any way seen fit by the applicant and it doesn't affect any other benefit claims and not everybody is aware of it. So just to go back briefly to the change that I mentioned above for um, bereavement support. There's been a campaign to get it changed because there's obviously a loophole, loophole there of people who are cohabiting but aren't married. And at the moment, the campaign was covering unmarried parents who were not eligible. So that campaign 
you maybe all have heard of it, I'm not sure, so I'll just go into it briefly. But the campaign began in 2018 with the McLaughlin case, when an unmarried mother of four children, whose cohabiting partner of 23 years died, but their application was rejected. She took her case to the Supreme Court. Then a similar case of Jackson and others in 2020 went to the High Court after being declined for bereavement support payment. So the court ruled that in both these cases, it was a breach of European Convention on Human Rights because it was discriminated against, against children on the grounds just because of their parents' relationship legal status. So this brought out the bereavement benefits remedial order. It's quite a mouthful. And that proposal was put before Parliament in July 2021. It's now been passed by Parliament and it's basically awaiting the rubber stamp from the House of Lords. So the new definition for bereavement payment will be two, two persons living together as if they were married or civil partners, which will cover those cohabiting partners who do have children. I mean that they will now be eligible when the House of Lords say yes um, for the bereavement support payment. Now it's hoped this is going to help a great number of bereaved families. There's still a few areas that need to be clarified. I did check with bereavement support before I came to the chain today to see if it had been clarified yet. But whether it's going to be backdated and as to when has not been finalised. But they are hopeful that this will become law um, and applicable in early spring. So it doesn't seem too far away and it is a wee step in the right direction. Um, benefits awareness. So when you're thinking about benefits, those are the two main benefits when you're looking at helping a family with funeral costs. But one other area which I think sometimes gets overlooked is that, and it's just a general benefit idea, that people who recently believe, bereaved, their income may have been affected and it may be now that they're eligible for other general benefits, whether it be universal credit, housing benefit. And it's just been aware that people who recently believe, believed, such as Craig and all these people who are phoning in, they're not always thinking straight. They're not always thinking about all the options that are out there and they're not often aware of what, what is out there in terms of government support if they've never been involved in the benefit system before. So it's always quite a good and simple option just to go over a general benefits calculator with them. There's a few government recommended ones entitled to benefits calculator or the turn to us one. Um, and that just gives some clarity to really, their entitlement in regards to gen uh, general benefits. And if somebody then becomes eligible for these benefits, they can then in turn apply for funeral support payment. So it's always worth a, worth a check um, when you're helping recently bereaved people with their funeral planning. So keeping in mind this benefits information, I thought I would just share a case study from somebody who called in just in January. So for this one, we've got Catherine, 39, living in Livingston, works in retail. Her mother passed away and her dad, unfortunately, was unable to cope with any of the arrangements. He needed a wee bit of physical and emotional support from Catherine. She went to the local funeral director, was quoted £6,000. Dad, though, is on income-related ESA, although Catherine's not on any benefits. They would like a full funeral service, as this is what her mum wanted. Sorry too fast, Emma. But they do not have enough for a deposit. Dad's got a little amount of savings, um, but it was nowhere near enough to cover the deposit that the funeral director who quoted £6,000. So what could we do to help Catherine? Took down all the personal details and the funeral wishes. And first point to note to Catherine that although Catherine wasn't on any benefits, Dad was on the income related ESA. And he would be deemed to be the one who was responsible financially to pay for his wife's funeral. So dad could apply for the funeral support payment with Catherine's support. The family had never heard of funeral support payment, so they were actually quite delighted at the possibility of that wee bit of financial help. Her dad, though, was 68, so they, he wasn't able to claim the bereavement support payment being over the retirement age. Catherine and I had a good chat about things and she explained that she was really drained. She was caring for her dad, she was looking after her three children and she described 
as making 300 phone calls that she was having to do. So when I offered to get her some quotes from other funeral directors, she was she snapped my hand off. So I phoned around quite a few funeral directors and I thought it was quite valuable just to share with you sort of the experience of getting quotes because it's not a part of my job that I do often, but in, in doing this, it really opened my eyes as to what happens out there sometimes in the funeral industry. So the first one I spoke to would not consider taking the family on at all because there was going to be a funeral support payment involved. They said in their own words, we were burned by others who never paid and so we prefer people just to pay up front. Another I spoke to said absolutely they would take the family on but because there was a funeral support payment involved they said the treatment would be slightly different. I asked what this, this actually meant so what what they suggested was that they would take Catherine's mum into their care from the hospital mortuary and they would keep her within their care at the funeral parlour, but they wouldn't be able to carry out the funeral until the funeral support payment actually came through. Now, when you consider the time scale for that, it's not predictable. <laughs> it's not even guaranteed. Um, so the family would then be left in that kind of limbo waiting until the funeral support payment came through before they could hold the funeral service. The reason when I asked them was exactly the same as the previous funeral director. Fortunately, though, I did manage to find a funeral director who was accommodating, was willing to take 10% deposit from the family, which was affordable um, with the dad's savings. They would allow time as well for the family to receive the funeral support payment before they required the balance. I did ask them from my learning experience if, if the family were to have a service at nine o'clock at the crematorium, would that make a difference? And in fact, that was going to save the family £110. The family were delighted with that. Whether that information would have been offered if I hadn't asked, I'm not too sure. But in this instance, I, did, I was there to ask the question. So thankfully, the family managed to save that money. There was another funeral director, interestingly, who the family didn't go with in the end, but just to show you the different options that are out there, who said that they would perform a service at the funeral parlour with the deceased and the family. The cremation, though, would be taken, would be done separately as a direct cremation after the service. Um, and they were willing to do that for a much lower price. Sort of the price of a direct cremation with just a little bit extra in there. So that was going to save the family nearly £600 if they decided to go for that option. It's not what the family wanted, um, but it was interesting to hear four completely different offerings to the family from funeral directors, all within sort of just a 10 mile radius of each other, really. So I took all those quotes, information back to Catherine and her family. Um, and left them to go through their options together as a family. They were extremely grateful. And I think this case study in itself highlights that the funeral industry does have some sort of hidden factors, if you like, cost savings that need to be drawn out at times, and they're not always openly offered to families. So in thinking about that, it's not just knowing how to reduce the cost, but also maybe having that voice, asking the question, or get somebody to do it for you when you're grieving that could really make a difference for some people. So, on to sort of charities and grants, um, a large number of people who find themselves in the funeral poverty are not always those benefits, but they're on low incomes. They're not eligible for the benefits that are there. They don't have savings, so where else are they going to turn? Now, John's mentioned you know, some of these figures that 23% borrowed money from a friend, 15% of people are selling their belongings to pay. And when they're faced with such a significant but necessary expense, what other options are there apart from these sort of money borrowing, quite scary figures? So there are charities out there who will give grants to help with the cost of a funeral, depending on the circumstances. 
One of the best search tools, which I'm sure probably many on the call have used, is the Turn to Us grant search, which is really an excellent tool trying to source grants through charities. There's also a book out there, I don't know if everybody knows, called Grants for Individuals in Need by Jessica Threlfall, and that's got in it how to make a successful application, also very useful, tips in there, and also sort of a list of uh, useful organisations. So charities, they will help people with funeral costs. The issue really with them is they're not always easy to find, and a lot of them do require quite detailed financial information. And it can take a lot of effort filling in the forms. So some people that you may, some bereaved people are, they might require quite a lot of assistance filling out these applications. There are grants available in places that you may not expect. And to be honest, it's constantly been a search and a real learning process for me. And I am learning every day and trying to build up sort of a bank a database, if you like, of charities and places where we can go. I think the most valuable bit of information that I've learned when looking for charities and grants is that you re really need a whole holistic picture of the person and the family in need. Address, location where they're staying, occupation, any health issues, even their energy companies, or if they're a member of a club or a union. As you can see from the diversity of places that are up there, we've got care worker charities, transport industry, British Gas, Leukemia Care, um, the Masonic Charitable Fund. So all these places would be willing to offer a grant if we if you get an application put in and the criteria is met. And these are just some examples. There's many, many more out there. It is just sourcing them and making an appropriate application. And it's also worth remembering that although some charities maybe do not provide a direct funeral grant, they may provide assistance to families in need families in crisis and families who have been impacted by such a funeral cost may come under that remit and it might be worth putting in an application there. Another another way that's become slightly more popular recently to raise funds for funeral costs is the crowdfunding. So through sort of the rise of social media becoming so popular, people have been using crowdfunding for all sorts of things, birthdays, medical treatments, helping people in crisis. I'm sure I've seen some random ones for people getting body tucks and things like that. But actually, it has turned into quite a useful tool for some people who are using it to raise money for funeral costs. You can set up a tribute page. Um, people can share memories of uh, the person who's died and can, con sorry, and can contribute funds um, through the crowdfunding page. It's easily shared via social media, emails. You see them often on Facebook appearing um, when people are doing charity events. And it's definitely, definitely becoming a more popular thing to do. Um, friends and family often feel quite honoured that they're able to donate. And actually the, the page that is set up, the tribute page, can actually create quite a positive memory of the person who's died. You can see there, there's a few pages that you can use in different ways to do it. So it's always best to have a quick check with the person and see if there is one that is more appropriate for them. So the last case study that I have got for you, I was thinking about the charities and grants and thinking about a person that I helped sort of through this route. Um, this one was only a couple of weeks ago um, and it came through from Sarah, who lives in Falkirk with her husband Robert. They're both sort of in their mid 40s. Sarah works in the care sector, is on a minimum wage, and Robert works full time in the transport industry, also sort of on a minimum wage. Now, Robert's brother Alex, he died suddenly in Glasgow. Alex was um, unemployed, had a long term history of addiction and medical issues, and he was quite estranged from the family, but he was keeping in contact with Robert. Unfortunately, the rest of the family were very much estranged. Um, there's family dynamics there that just meant no family member was willing to help uh, Robert and Sarah to organise Alex's funeral. Robert and Sarah had no savings and no ability to take on a loan. They were really running their mortgage for a one bedroom property, paying their bills, living month to month. So how can we help them? 
so I took sort of the what I was chatting about when we were talking about Charities and Grant there, took a holistic history and picture of Sarah and Robert. Um, we talked about what Sarah and Robert wanted for the funeral wishes for Alex. Um, their main wish was it, it was to be in Glasgow and they didn't at the time want a direct commission. They would like to have been there. First of all, we did the benefit check. But as both Sarah and Robert are working, uh, and although they're low wage earners, there's no benefits out there that were uh, applicable to Sarah and Robert. We then called local local funeral directors um, to get some quotes. And with that, and my experience from the previous call, I did try several funeral directors throughout the local area in Glasgow. I asked about all different time slots, different payment schemes, anybody that would be willing to help. Um, with a payment plan, checked for deposit levels. I took all the info back to Sarah and we chatted through it. But there wasn't one there that was affordable for them. There wasn't one that they could even pay that upfront deposit. They didn't have that level of money sitting there ready to pay. So I went back and we went, I went through, I used the turn to us search tool actually, and went through a charity and grant check for them. It pulled up one that I had on my last screen, the Care Workers Charity, and as Sarah was working in care and had been for several time, she seemed to fit. So I made contact with the Care Workers Charity, quite excited that we were going to get some money from them. Eligib eligibility was perfect, as Sarah fitted into the criteria. I spoke to them, but unfortunately we came across another hurdle. So the Care Workers Charity, like many of the charities, there's so many allocated funds per month to be able to hand out. And unfortunately, a serious call came in at the end of January. They had no more funds left for that month. They can never guarantee when the next lot of funding is going to come through. So they said to keep, keep them in mind, but at present, there was no money available. I went back to Sarah, unfortunately, and we had another chat. We went through the potential of the public health funeral and that really we couldn't see another way that Sarah and Robert could come up with the money to organise the funeral for Alex. So Sarah took it upon herself, she called the local government uh, where Alex was, but unfortunately this was another brick wall. They didn't accept that there was no other person to pay because there was these other family members milling around as such. Um, they wanted Sarah and Robert to make contact with them. They wanted police reports. I'm not quite sure what that was all about. But in the end, it was just too much for Robert and Sarah. And they just they just didn't want it. They just said it just came across as far too much hassle, far too much to do, and they didn't want it. So I went back to the grant search. I was determined to try and find something, just something that could give them a bit of help. And we went through it and I had actually, I thought, re the transport union looking at, there was a few when you go into the charities and grants for transport sort of workers. So I called Sarah and asked him if Robert was in a union. Now Robert wasn't in a union, so I thought, oh, that's another brick wall. But Sarah was actually in unison. So I went to unison, went through the website, searched through the grants, and actually they do provide a funeral cost grant for a family who's been suddenly impacted um, financially. I spoke to Unison, absolutely they said Sarah would be a candidate who they would accept an application for from, she did meet the criteria. So I would love to tell you <laughs> that she's actually got the money, but at present the application has been accepted and at the moment we're awaiting the outcome. So we've got everything crossed at the moment that that actually may allow Sarah and Robert to have a funeral for Alex. So uh, that's just my conclusion, thank, Joanna, thank, I promise. No, thanks so much. Emma, we just need my, thank you so much. I've, um, I was hanging on your every word. I, I, I think it's unbelievable that someone who's only been seven months working in this sector has got so much knowledge. Emma, it's fun, lovely listening to you, but we must move into the next section. Yep, of and course. what we're going to do is just have a brief breakout um, uh, for everyone. We'll come back 
Uh, and then what we're going to do is if you can, once we come back into the main room, you can put some questions in and we'll do a Q&A at the end. And if there's any cues we haven't answered, we'll um, follow up afterwards, Kay. But thanks so much. So hi, everyone. Hi. Just take us a moment to all rejoin the meeting. And then I'm going to hand over to, I think it's Tony, but Tony and Annie are both here. I, uh, is it, am I right that Tony's going to present? Yeah. Um, Annie's going to do a little bit, then I'm going to do a little bit, but I'll, well, I'll, be, I'll, I'll be doing you both, the slides. Then. Okay, so we'll just um, I'll just try to spell out you both right. Uh, just check every, in fact, uh, just check that everyone is in who needs to be in. Great, thanks. I hope you all got to introduce um, a yourself to at least one or two other people. Uh, these connections do make a big difference. Um, oh, Tony, I'm, it's going to start being you, and I'll find Annie to make it so her face is appearing to everyone in a second. Um, uh, we were just having a discussion with a couple of people who are left. Uh, that couldn't get into the groups and saying, look, actually, interestingly, one of the bits that Emma started talking about was all these campaigns to try to reduce funeral poverty are about maybe trying to reduce the overall amount that people fall into funeral debt. We often see people too late in the journey and they're already in debt and there's little you can do, but it's about funeral debt. And actually this issue of deposits is very little, very often overlooked if you're something to, you need £2,000 to get in the door sometimes if you're something in cash up front, if you're going to have a, an easy process. And that bit can be often something that we need to spend more time on. I'll try to talk about respectful funerals in the Q&A. I can see that in the chat. So if you have any questions for Tony and Annie, or if you have any questions for Emma, I'll chair a little Q&A at the end. Pop them in the chat um, and uh, if, if you've got a question in advance. So Tony, I think you've got a presentation. If you could just, if you could first, before I hand over to you, could you just try sharing your presentation, if you don't mind, just so I can certainly try. do the management, the, the, the team's management aspect of it in case it's not sharing properly. Brilliant, it's worked. Perfect. Thank you, over to you. Thank you. Annie, are you there? I, I am here. And I'm, John, I'm quite happy with you showing Tony's face, to be honest, if he's, you know, <laughs> I don't mind at all. Um, but listen, thank you so much, uh, John and Emma, for inviting us along uh, today. Um, uh, Tony and I are part of the National Engagement Team with Social Security Scotland, and it's our role to raise visibility and awareness of Social Security, and also just of all of the benefits uh, we administer. I'm not going to lie, Tony and I don't know everything, but if you have questions about funeral support payment or indeed any of the benefits that we deliver, we can take questions away and find out the answers for you. So, so don't be shy about posing questions. We will take them away um, and we will try and find out. Tony, if you pop on to the next slide. I'm trying, Annie. It doesn't seem to want to go. <laughs> Here we go. So. I'm just going to give you a very quick overview of Social Security Scotland. Some of you may not have heard of us before. Um, Tony will then move on to, I suppose, the topic of interest today, which is you know, support payment. And then, as John said, there'll be time for, for questions uh, around uh, the, the end. Tony, if you could pop on to the next slide. So, Social Security Scotland is an executive agency of Scottish Government. Um, and we were established uh, in 2018. And have been set up to administer the, the social security system. We're currently de delivering 12 benefits. It's about to be 13 at the end of this month. Um, and you may have heard of some of them. So Scotch child payment and adult disability payment are some of those benefits that we're delivering. And once we're fully operational, we're going to be delivering benefits for people on low incomes, disabled people, carers, young people entering the workplace and to help people heat their homes. We've got a couple of office, offices. We've got a head office in Dundee and a second site in Glasgow. We've also got a, a kind of team of people who can support uh, you and support clients. Um, and I'll, we'll touch on that towards the end. Tony, move on. So our purpose is uh, said to administer the uh, social security system effectively and in accordance with the Act and our charter. And I'll just very quickly um, touch on our, our charter in the next slide. But our promise is that we want to deliver support built around clients where and when they need it. And our values, um, which you will see in all of our literature and all of our slides in our buildings are dignity, fairness and respect. And it's at the, the core of everything that we're, we're doing and trying to achieve with Social Security Scotland. Um, um, so in addition to the, the values that we have, we're trying to promote equality and tackle poverty. And you've been speaking about funeral poverty today, and that's a big strand of the work that we're doing. We want to ensure efficiency and align our activities with other public sector bodies. 
for the people that we serve. And obviously we want to contribute to the economy, society and to the protection of our environment. By the end of this year, actually by the end of last year, we are delivering benefits to around about a million clients in, in Scotland. Just, I did say I was just going to very quickly mention our charter because for me this is a really core document because it sets out what everybody can achieve from us. So it's available on our website and we'll share this presentation afterwards so you've got all the sort of links and information in there. But it's um, it was created by obviously Scottish Government and Social Security Scotland and with organisations, many of whom will be on this call today. Um, but most importantly for me is by people who have lived the experience of social security systems and they are continually involved as we evolve and design new benefit processes. Um, but their voice is at the heart of what we're doing because fundamentally for me, social security is a human right. Um, it's something that any of us can need at any time. So I'll just, if you pop onto the next slide, Tony. These are the list of the current benefits we are, we're delivering at the moment. So as I said, you may be familiar with some more than others. Adult disability payment is, is currently being been rolled out um, and Scottish child payment was extended in November. Now. So you may be familiar with some of them. I won't go through them all, but again, if you have information is on our website about all of our different benefits and there's leaflets and stakeholder toolkits for clients or if you want to give information to your clients. So um, again, we'll share the presentation and you've got the links, um, but if you have any questions on any of them at all, do get in touch with us. Um, we've still got some benefits to deliver. Uh, pension age, winter heating payment, pension age disability payment, employment injury assistance and Scottish carers allowance. Winter heating payment will be the next benefit we deliver towards the end of this month. So that is a quick canter through Social Security Scotland and what we do, but I'm going to pass over to Tony and he's going to uh, take you through funeral support payment in more depth. Thanks very much, Annie. Um, I know that we have limited time, um, so I won't, won't quite be a roller coaster tour through, but I'll, I'll certainly try and get through this as quickly as I, as I can, but still impart the information. So funeral support payment helps pay for some funeral costs of people living in Scotland who are on certain tax credits or benefits. But it's important to note that the payment will not necessarily cover all the costs of a funeral. And that was something that, that John alluded to in his introduction earlier. It is support that's available, but it won't cover the costs of everything in a lot of cases. Now, the amount received will depend on the council area the person lived in when they died. And we have an example later on um, that, that, that can, visualises that for you. It's a one-off payment delivered by Social Security Scotland uh, and it replaces the funeral support fund that was previously paid by the UK government. So it makes a number of changes to that, um, helping more people due to its wider eligibility, increasing the flat rate of the payment each year to take into account the impacts of inflation um, and a fairly streamlined application process that hopefully makes it easier to apply. Um, and also the payment can be made to either the client or the funeral director directly. Um, so, there's a wee sort of time frame um, for Scottish child payment. The application can be made after the date of death and up to six months after the funeral has occurred. Um, the person who's applying for funeral support payment must ordinarily be a resident in Scotland and the person who has died must have been ordinarily resident in the United Kingdom. Uh, the payment will cover funerals that take place um, in the United Kingdom, but in some cases uh, we will cover costs for funerals in member states of the European Union, Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway or Switzerland. I would love to have the exact legislation in front of me that, that explains why those particular countries. I don't know. I just think it's, 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 it's certainly worthwhile to mention it. I will have to do some investigating and find out. Now, it's reasonable for the nearest relative of the person who died um, to accept the financial responsibility for the funeral. That, that, that's one of the, the caveats we have. Um, if the client or their partner is not the nearest relative, however, the client in, in that case will need to help us to understand why it's reasonable um, for them to have accepted the responsibility for the funeral costs. But that's not so much um, a speed bump. It's, um, it's just something that's in there. And, the majority of the time, um, the explanations given are usually more than enough to satisfy eligibility. 
qualifying benefit, as with all of Social Security Scotland's benefits, um, the applicant must or their partner must be in receipt of one of the qualifying benefits, which we'll, we'll go into very, very shortly. So, as we've said, the payment can be made to either the client or the funeral director who plans the funeral depending on the client's choice. If the client later changes their mind, so for example, if they initially specify they prefer the money to go straight to the funeral director, but they change their mind and state that they want the payment to be made to them, then we will change um, the payment nominee in line with the client's wishes. And only one person can receive funeral support payment for the funeral. The client or the partner do not have to be named on the bill, but they do need to be responsible and liable for the funeral costs. And that comes down to, in the previous slide, you know, they, they, they need to help us understand why it's reasonable for them to have accepted responsibility. Uh, clients are eligible to apply in the event of a stillbirth or an infant death, but unfortunately, a parent who's had a miscarriage is not eligible for funeral support payment. And I think it's also worth then pointing out um, that clients cannot make a claim for costs that are already covered by a funeral plan. Um, the costs for a plot or layer that is already owned by the deceased or the family, the cost of burying cremated ashes or a memorial service or remembrance where a funeral or a cremation is not taking place. And clients will not receive a payment if costs have already been covered by other funeral support, for example, the funeral expenses payment in England or Wales. So these are our qualifying benefits and the client or the partner needs to have been in receipt of one of them um, on the date that the application was made. So that's child tax credit universal credit, income support, pension credit, working tax credit, but only for those with disability or the severe disability element, housing benefit, income based job seekers allowance, but not contribution based, and likewise income, income related employment and support allowance, but not contribution based income and employment support allowance. Within funeral support payment, there are elements that will be covered, taking into consideration to calculate um, the entitlement. These can be capped and are subject to um, reasonability and available evidence. So the first one is the cost for the falling, which in some circumstances, as we say, may be capped. That's burial or cremation, and that includes purchase of burial plot and associated fees, including grave digging. Certain medical documents that allow the burial or cremation to take place. Uh, documents to access the money of the deceased to help pay for the funeral and remover of medical devices if the funeral is a cremation. And what we're talking about mainly there is the removal of a pacemaker. Transportation or travel costs. Um, so to move uh, the person who died more than 50 miles, but the client will be liable for the first 50 miles of the journey. And it will also cover one return journey to either arrange a funeral or to the funeral location. This includes travel by bus, train and car, but does not include travel in a funeral car. Um, help may be given towards travel by taxi, boat and plane, and that presumably be for those uh, claims where it's in the European Union, Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway or Switzerland. And there is a flat rate element to cover sundry expenses. In most cases, that will be £1,070.60 or a maximum of £130.65 if a funeral is in place. Um, like I say, that's a, a flat rate to cover additional expenses, and that's usually used to cover things like funeral director fees, including coffin, funeral cars and flowers. So we do have a little example of costs and how that can depend on the local authority. Now, this is a slightly simplistic example just to highlight the difference in costs between local authority areas. So in our little example, the deceased lived in Glasgow. And the cremation was to be held at Clydebank Crematorium, which is in West Dumbartonshire, so two different local authority areas. Um, so because the deceased lived in Glasgow, Social Security Scotland, we need to apply the local authority cap to compare what the difference would be between if they were cremated in Glasgow or cremated in Western Barnshire, Western Barnshire. So the flat rate is applicable for both. That's £1,070, sorry, £1,070.60. The cremation in Glasgow would have cost £685. The cost in uh, Clydebank Crematorium was £752. 
as they were resident in Glasgow, there would not have been a non-resident fee. But in um, Clydebank in the Western Berkshire area, £286 is applied. We've not included any transport, there's no travel, there's no documents. So the total award that the, the, the client can receive if it was being cremated in Glasgow is £1,755.60, but the actual cost um, that was incurred as it was held in Clydebank, Clydebank Crematorium in Western Barnshire is £2,108.60. So that's a £353 of a difference. See, because they were resident uh, and lived in Glasgow, we have to apply that local authority cap in that scenario. I do have a little testimony. Um, it's kind of like, a, a, if, if you like, a, 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 a real case scenario. And this was just someone within the Asian community um, pointing out that it could be quite humiliating if it's known you've had to ask for financial help, especially to, to bury a parent. Um, they contacted us at Social Security Scotland. It was treated anonymously because she was too embarrassed to give her name. However, within the first few minutes of the conversation, you know, they were put at ease, they felt comfortable and were able to, to, to carry on um, with the application um, for Social Security Scotland's assistance with the funeral support payment. So how can people access our service? They can do it by applying online at mygov.scot. They can call us on our free phone number at 0800 182 2222. Um, there is a number there. Oh, jumping about, I beg your pardon. There is a number for them to call us on if they're phoning from abroad, and that's direct into the Dundee number. Um, they can request a paper form by calling that free phone number um, and returning it by post. British Sign Language users can use the Contact Scotland app to contact us by video relay. And if English isn't a client's first language, if they telephone us, um, we can get in touch with an interpreting service and they can assist with well over 100 languages using our phone line. And one of the other ways, and Annie mentioned this earlier in her presentation, support to complete an application for funeral support payment is available through our local delivery service. And that can either be done within person, um, someone from our local delivery team will come round and visit a client's home and help them complete the application. It can be done by video chat, with one of our advisors or by telephone. So clients can book an appointment with our local delivery service again by calling us on our free phone number or through our web chat facility or writing to us to book an appointment. So for you as stakeholders, we do have a variety of resources and toolkits. Um, you will find that on our website, if you go directly to www.socialsecurity.gov.scot slash guidance resources, um, you will find there are a variety of flyers, of leaflets, of brochures available in a variety of formats, including easy read and large print, as well as in a vast variety of languages. Um, so just before we go, we'd just like to kind of ask the question, is there more that we can do to support you in your organisations, wherever it is that you're all from today? Are there more resources or information you need from this? Are there specific resources that would be useful for you and your organisation? Um, we will pop our email address into the chat function, and that will be the national engagement team, the team that Annie and I both represent. Do feel free to Get in touch with Annie or myself or the wider team if you have any suggestions, any ideas about how we can support you or this kind of resources or information that you will require. And that is essentially it for us from today. We will have time for some questions. And if you don't want to ask a question here today at this event, again, when we pop the email address into the chat bar, do feel free to get in touch with any of your questions. It's worth pointing out, Annie and I are not technical experts. Um, if we can't answer any of your questions today, we'll certainly take those questions away and we will put them to our colleagues back at Social Security Scotland. So on behalf of Annie and myself, thanks very much for listening. And to John and to Emma, thanks for inviting us along today. It's been an absolute pleasure.
Thanks, Tony. That was really useful. We're going to share the presentation. If, could you just unshare your screen while we're there? Thanks. Um, if you've got a question for, uh, I mean, it could be for Annie, but let's say Tony or Emma, pop it in the chat. I've got a couple that I'm going to ask on their behalf just now, but everyone here is keen to engage after this as well. So if there's follow up questions from anyone or more resources, I really want to make sure that, you know, everyone hears our kind of, what's it, uh, subjective opinion that the a major difference is that benefits being devolved isn't particularly about the amount of money and there is a bit more flexibility. It's about the nature of how you engage the team there and their knowledge and expertise and flexibility of the, frankly, the call handlers, if you say, I mean, who could quite easily say, you know, it's a stereotype, but like computer says no a lot of, and they often don't. So, you know, it's credit there. Uh, for the vast majority of people applying, all they need to do is really call and speak to someone in the Social Security Scotland team about this benefit and they'll walk through it. There's a few edge cases and I thought your example of that Clyde Bank crematorium one was an excellent one, Tony, where it's worth having to think about beforehand potentially with someone. If you've got a client, do think about those kind of edge cases, but the team will often help with that and Emma and Jan uh, can help if, if necessary too. But we quite often where it's relatively straightforward end up you know, we might speak to someone and just say, actually, you know, get back to us if this is complicated, but you might be impressed by how relatively straightforward it is. So do get in touch with someone if you need support, but watch out for those edge cases where it can be worth having a think in advance of making plans. You know, you might need to change a funeral date or funeral arrangements to make sure people are getting as much as they can. So um, I just briefly touch on a couple of the questions that came in. So Tony, so, uh, someone's saying amongst the support that's available for people and they've got face to face support and telephone support and things, is there anything that, that helps people with learning disabilities that people can access? Um, Annie, do you have yeah, any? Well, we do have specific support. So if somebody needs additional support, they can appoint a, an advocate. Um, so we have a, a system where you can appoint somebody who can then support you through that process. Um, so absolutely, um, we've got multiple different supports to try and make sure that anybody who needs to access our service can do it in a way that fits their needs. Um, if you need to find out specific information about that, I can share information on VoiceAbility, who are our, our partner in delivering some of those services. Thanks, Annie. Um, uh, Jane's asked a question. I'm going to follow up with Jane, I think, afterwards, uh, just to make sure we answer her question in the, the, the right way. Uh, but there's another question that's saying about whether th there's an issue internationally with people either where they've died in this country while being resident uh, in another country and similarly the vice versa, where uh, maybe a relative in Scotland is dealing with someone who's died abroad. Um, that these these can make it complicated for claiming benefits and also complicated just for arranging a funeral. It's worth saying. I was actually going to ask I, I, this might sound like I'm about to ask Tony about it, but I was actually going to ask Emma about her experience supporting people in that space. Like, is this something we come across? Uh, like, is it clear where to turn or is this something where it kind of slightly falls between the cracks and needs a little bit of work for people? Um, for, you're on mute, by the way, Emma. But what's your experience either way? And you've only got a couple of minutes. So, you know, overseas, someone's died overseas or someone's died here who's resident overseas. So have you supported people in that situation? It, yeah, I have, I've supported people in both situations, not not a lot. Um, I supported a person whose husband died in Scotland and lived in Canada. Um, they, neither of the, and I supported somebody as well, sorry, whose dad died in Thailand and they were in Scotland. Um, both people that I supported were, the benefit system wasn't involved in that, so I'm not entirely sure how that would work in those scenarios as such. Um, the interest perspective is just for the people abroad, the lady in Canada thought she had to pay for an ambulance, she thought she had to pay for the hospital, she had thought she had to pay for so many more things, so she was actually delighted by the price of funeral in Scotland. Um, but obviously the issues that arose from the little girl, who young girl whose um, father died in Thailand were different and it involved repatriation of her dad back to Scotland and then the normal process over here in Scotland. Um, but yeah, Thanks, as such, I've not had the benefit part of that, John. I, I know we've, as we've been involved in this over the years, it, we've often been in the discussion where people have started a discussion about funerals uh, or repatriation and repatriation can cost tens of thousands. And even if you're insured, your premium is going to be huge. There's an important bit around how people transport ashes internationally as opposed to um, uh, the deceased uh, before they've been cremated. Uh, but that's for a different day, if you're something. 
Okay, we are going to wrap up in a second. Um, I can see another question, but we're going to have run out of time. So we'll make sure that anything in the chat there does get addressed. I just wanted to say two things before I say thanks to everyone. One is on a temporary basis for the next few months, Caledonia Funeral Aid has a small number of £200 grants that we can uh, on a discretionary basis offer to a small number of people each month. And it's really for those people who fall between the cracks, you know, so aren't entitled to other things. Um, we're Please, we're going to be really short. We don't have that many available, but if there's someone where you think it's useful for them to get support, it needs to be someone we are providing active support to, so we really understand the case and we've made sure every other op opportunity to save them costs and things has been explored. But there's a wee window there, and if you have someone that you think has just lost someone, they need that, there's nothing else that can be done, we may have some flexibility. But it's temporary, it's only for the next few months, but Emma and Jan will be administering that. And the other is, if you know anyone who wants to volunteer with Caledonian Funeral Aid, please flag it up. We're trying to create a small team of trained volunteers who can work in this space, both doing face to face work in their local community, raising awareness of these matters, because a lot of this is about awareness raising rather than picking up the pieces after it's happened, uh, but also potentially work with some people on the phone. So if you know anyone who could give up half a day, a day a week, maybe uh, is interested in that, uh, just call Emma and Jan on our normal Caledonia funeral number or email them um, and we'd be delighted with anyone who wants to volunteer in that space. Even just 10 people in a team could make an enormous difference to this nationwide issue, uh, we think. Uh, thanks so much. I'm sorry, the couple of questions we'll get back to you later, um, but um, thank you so much for attending. The We've been overwhelmed with how many people wanted to attend, so we will run another a lot of this I think later in the year and I also think for those of you some of the people in the call actually know a lot about this I think it's clear and deal with this in great detail so it might be worth us having a more in-depth training session for people who really just need more like the training aspect where it is a bit more complicated and really difficult cases even just sharing our experience of that so we'll leave the door open to that email us if you're interested in that and we'll try to set something up for a sort of more targeted group of people who are more experts in this area maybe we can create a secondary support service that's a little bit more informed Thanks so much to everyone. Uh, I hope you have a lovely day. Sorry, we're three minutes overrun, uh, but I, I think it's really, uh, I've found it very valuable and I've been involved in this for a long time. Thanks so much and we will send those presentations around. Cheers. Goodbye everyone.